your Bibles and look in 1 Timothy chapter 2. That's uh, where we're going to continue our study this morning of this book and uh, try to cover as much of, if not hopefully the whole chapter this morning and uh, have a, a better understanding of the chapter. When you get to 1 Timothy chapter 2, you have a chapter that's dealing primarily um, with, uh, with the worship of the, of the local congregation. And as we've talked about in this class, I think there's a twofold purpose that Paul has in writing uh, this letter. We see one of those purposes right at the beginning in chapter 1 and verse 3 where he tells Timothy um, to uh, command uh, certain men that they teach no other doctrine than the doctrine of Christ. Uh, and uh, so that, that's carried through the entire letter. We also see another purpose in uh, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15 uh, where Paul tells Timothy uh, that he's writing these things in order that he might know how to conduct himself uh, in the church, in the house of God. And no doubt worship is a part of uh, the activities of the church as well. And so I want us to pick up, we looked at just a little bit of this last week as we ended the class. Uh, but let's pick back up in uh, 1 Timothy chapter, one, or chapter 2 and verse 1 and uh, read through these first few verses. Paul says, Therefore... I exhort, for, uh, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. We pointed out last week that there's four different words that are used here that ought to be involved in our prayers. Uh, there's that idea of supplication where we're praying for our personal needs. There are our prayers that is a general, uh, general word used for our devotion and uh, our dependence upon God. There's the word intercession where we are petitioning the Almighty on behalf of somebody else, on behalf of their needs. And then there's the idea of giving of thanks. Um, and Paul says here that this needs to be done for all men, that we need to be praying for everybody. Who does that include? The whole world. Who does that include, Linda? What'd you say? Our enemies. Our enemies. Is that hard? No. Praying for your enemies. Have you ever done it? Is that hard? Who does that include? Praying for all men. It includes all. Is that what you said, Trina? Yes. All men. And women. And women. That is correct. <laughs> so uh, we know that men need it more than women. But uh, this, this uh, we're supposed to pray for men and women. Trudy? It's pray for men, both women, men and women, but especially the household of faith. Okay. Uh, do you pray for your brethren? Do you pray for your uh, brothers and sisters in Christ? Uh, Jerry, uh, Jerry points out that this is uh, praying for both men and women because that's, that's the word that's used here. Uh, it's the Greek word anthropos. We mentioned it last week. It's that, it's that word for mankind. Uh, so uh, while, uh, while you may know of some men who really need the prayers, uh, it is also for women as well. So praying for all men, uh, all uh, uh, of mankind, for, verse 2 specifies even further, for kings and for all who are in authority. How often do you pray for our government? How often do you pray for our king? Or our president? How often do you pray for our senators, for our Congress, for our governor, for our local officials? Do you ever think that such prayers are fruitless, are meaningless, are useless? Huh? Feels like it sometimes. Do you look at our government and think, boy, what's one little prayer going to do, you know? What's one little Christian living right, doing right, trying to teach right, and praying to God? What's one little, what difference is that going to make? God, you know, so if you look at the condition of our nation and you throw up your hands and say, well, you know, this, what good is it going to do to pray? You know, what, what, say that again, Betsy? If everybody gives up, then nobody's praying. Should we give up on our nation? Yes. 
Should we give up on our president, on our Congress? You want to sometimes. Don? Well, if you think one prayer, I'm going to help. Pray three or four times. <laughs> Don says if you think one prayer is not going to help, then pray three or four times. Uh, that, that ought to characterize what we're doing. Lonnie? That's right. If you pray thinking that it's not going to do any good, then it's not going to do any good. Isn't that what James says? Uh, pray without doubting. Um, there, there should, you know, it, if, if there's any doubt or any wavering that's involved in our prayers. When you're praying, who are you praying to? God. Praying to God. If you have the slightest doubt that it's going to do any good. That, that, that one prayer, you know, how, how can one prayer change the direction of our nation or, or do anything? Who are you questioning? If, are you questioning the president's ability to change? Are you questioning the, the nation's ability to change? Are you questioning the governor's ability to change? Or are you questioning God's ability to make those changes? Gladys? Uh, I, I wouldn't recommend it. I would not recommend uh, questioning God. Would you? Um, not, t- testing God is, uh, is not something that needs to be uh, on the top of our list. But is that not what we do? If, it, if we either choose not to pray because we don't think it's going to do any good, who are we questioning? Who are we testing? I mean, we're, we're, we're obviously limiting, our, you know, ourselves and what we can do to influence and do uh, and make a difference. But we're questioning God's ability. Or if we pray, but still, man, this, I'm going to do it because God says in First Timothy chapter two, I'm supposed to pray for all men, for kings and for all who are in authority. But I just don't see what this is going to do. Still questioning God. Jerry, did you have your hand up? Well, that's, that's, Scripture teaches us in Romans chapter 13, uh, among other places, that, that these men are, um, and women, these uh, leaders uh, are there by the power of God. Uh, even, in, uh, let's see, even, in, even in the book of Daniel, uh, you go back and read the book of Daniel, and it says, uh, e- even back in the Old Testament, that God rules in the kingdoms of men. Who's in charge? Who was in charge in Sodom and Gomorrah? God was. Man forgot that. And man decided to, uh, to take it his own direction. But would God have even spared Sodom and Gomorrah from destruction? What, if there had been ten righteous people, God would have saved it. Can you find 10 righteous people in this nation? 20? 30? 40? I hope so. Gladys? That's right. When uh, they were leaving Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot's wife turned and looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. Look in verse 2. We're supposed to pray for everybody. We're supposed to pray for kings and all who are in authority. Why? What purpose? There's multiple purposes that that would have, but what's one of the purposes given in verse 2? That we may live, that we may lead what kind of a life? Quiet and peaceable. Why would praying for kings and those who are in authority lead to a quiet and peaceable life? So that we can worship? What, Lonnie? Okay, so that we wouldn't be persecuted. Uh, the, the two words here, uh, the, the idea of quiet means that, that we're free from distress from the outside. If we pray for our kings and those in authority, we, we will be free because of the power of God from the distress of those who are outside. That's the word quiet. The word peaceable means that we're free from the distress from inside. Free from without, free from within. 
free from that distress if I pray for those who are kings and those who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. So it's not just about me praying, it's about the way that I live. I need to, leave, I need to live a, a pious and godly life. I need to live a life uh, that's full of uh, reverence in serving God, full of uh, seriousness in my service to God, that it's not some kind of a flippant activity that I go through. Four, verse three, for this, for praying for our leaders, for praying for all men, for living a quiet and peaceable life, for living a life of godliness and reverence, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men, same wording that's in the chapter 2, verse 1, who desires all men, and uh, Jerry, is this just men? Who desires all men to be saved? Does God not care about the women? All mankind. Who desires, the word again is anthropos, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. When we were uh, uh, talking about this book in in our introductory classes, we looked at that, uh, at the definite article, T-H-E, the word the. God desires all men to be saved. By the way, that's passive. Being saved is passive. Why is that in the passive voice, you think? Do we have a responsibility? Is there anything we need to do in order to be saved? Does it, it's, it's not in the active voice to say that God has saved everyone. God just wants us to be saved. Has he provided the means for everybody to be saved? Yeah. God has done all that, that he is going to do uh, from the standpoint of sending his son as the propitiation for our sins. He wants everybody to be saved, but not everybody is saved. It's, we, it's sort of like uh, God has thrown the life preserver out to you in the water, but if you don't grab a hold of it, yeah. you're not going to be saved. Yeah, it's, it's like throwing that life preserver out there in the water. It's up to us to decide if we're going to grab a hold of it or not. Uh, and, and we pointed this out last week, but th- this passage, you know, is, is so plain and so clear that God wants everybody to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And yet Calvinists teach just the opposite. The God, they don't say God doesn't want everybody to be saved, but in the doctrine of, of total depravity uh, that John Calvin uh, began teaching that, that man is born in sin, he's condemned, he's condemned it with sin already, and he's totally deprived from God from the moment of his birth. The, the doctrine of unconditional election that John Calvin taught. Unconditional election taught that, uh, that those who are saved are selected, elected under no conditions. It's unconditional. So God unconditionally elected those to be saved, and unconditionally damned those who would be lost and there's nothing they can do about it except that's not what the Bible teaches. God wants all to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. How many truths are there? There's just one. How many knowledges of that truth are there? There's one. Does that tie in with our Wednesday night class about how can we understand the Bible alike? How many how many understandings are there of the truth? to come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants us to have that. Uh, And and that's what he has supplied to us. Four, verse five, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men. What's a mediator? A go between. So you've you've got the one God, you've got the Father, And you've got mankind, and the Bible says there's one God, and here's mankind, and there's one mediator between God and man. Who is that? Jesus Jesus Christ. You know what, um, in in order for a mediator to be qualified to be a mediator, and in order for a mediator to be successful in what he's trying to do, that mediator is needs to be able to relate equally to both sides. Because that's what a mediator is doing. A mediator is trying to draw two parties together. Okay? you got the party in heaven. you got the party on earth. You've got God and man. You've got Jesus 
trying to pull these parties together. In order for that mediator to be qualified for his job and to be successful at his job, he has to be equally related to both sides. Is Jesus uniquely qualified to be our mediator? Is, is he equally related to both parties in this covenant? Is, is, is he as closely related to God as you can be? He is God. Can't get any closer than that, right? He is God. Is he uniquely qualified in relationship to man? He became man. The Word, who is God, became flesh and dwelt among us. He was tempted in all points like as we are. He took on fleshly body. Philippians chapter 2 says, that, or Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 8 talks about the fact that he emptied himself. He came down to earth. He lived in a flesh and bones body. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2 verses, uh, last two verses, I think it's 17 and 18 of the chapter, says that he, he is uniquely qualified as our high priest because he's lived the life that we have lived. So here's Jesus, the one mediator between God and man, uniquely qualified and uniquely successful at drawing these two parties who have been distanced from each other because of sin, drawing them back together. Now look at what it says. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man. He's the go-between. The man Christ Jesus. What does verse 6 say about him? Verse 6 says that he gave himself a ransom for who? For all. I don't know if you all are familiar with John Calvin's tenets, and I hate to keep going back to him. But hit, hit the five tenets of Calvinism you've probably heard this, can be summed up in the word tulip. In tulip, uh, that word tulip, those five letters, you have the tenets of Calvinism. We've talked about total depravity. Uh, and you've, we've talked about unconditional election. That, that those who are saved are, are chosen by God, they're elected by God, based upon no conditions they've fulfilled at all. Just God selected who would be saved, who would be damned, and there's nothing they can do about it. That's found also in, in the... Uh, in the eye of tulip, which is irresistible grace, that God has given His grace, provided His grace to those who that He is unconditionally elected to be saved. He's imparted His grace, and it's irresistible. That's what John Calvin taught. That's not what Scripture teaches. That's what John Calvin taught, that the grace is irresistible, meaning what? You're going to be saved whether you like it or not. There's nothing you can do, but you cannot resist the grace of God. If He selected you to be saved... Tough luck, <laughs> you're going to be saved, whether you want to or not. That's the I. The L in tulip is interesting because of verse 6. The L in tulip says, or as John Calvin taught, that there was limited atonement. In limited atonement, John Calvin taught that Jesus only died for the elect. He didn't die for everybody. But remember, God according to John Calvin, unconditionally elected those to be saved. His grace was irresistible to them. They're going to be saved whether they want it or not. And so when Jesus came and died, he wouldn't die for those who were going to be damned anyway, would he? I mean, that'd be a waste of blood. So he only died for those who God decided to save. Limited atonement. Dirk? Yeah, too bad he didn't realize that was everybody. What does verse 6 say? Jesus, who's this unique mediator between God and man, trying to draw these two parties together, between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. For every last person on the face of the earth, he gave himself a ransom. What's a ransom, by the way? A payment. A price that is paid for what? For a release, to, to get someone out of bondage, to get someone out of, uh, 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 of some kind of a situation. Were we, are we in a situation? Are we in bondage with sin? What should happen to us is that we die. But instead of us dying, we had a ransom paid instead of us dying. When, when somebody pays a ransom, if, if, uh, you know, if, a, if someone is kidnapped, and someone pays a ransom. What's, the ransom is paid. 
instead of doing harm to that person, just take this money and let that person go. There's something put in, that, in the place of that person. Jesus was put in our place. He was the ransom for all to be testified in due time. That's similar to Galatians 4 and verse 4. It talks about Christ being uh, uh, revealed in, in God's time. For which, Paul says, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth. Underline again in your minds the word the. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. You think there were still Jews who had a problem with the gospel going to the Gentiles? Yeah. Paul says, I'm a teacher, and I'm a teacher, don't forget, of the Gentiles. Starting in verse 8, Paul says, I desire, therefore. What does that mean, by the way? When Paul says, I desire, there, go back up to verse 2. Therefore, I exhort, first of all. Um, go back up to chapter 1 and verse 18. Uh, this charge I commit to you, uh, son Timothy. Uh, go back to chapter 1 and verse 3. As I urged you when I left Macedonia. So what's the deal here? Is this just what Paul wants? Go down to chapter 2 and verse 12. I do not permit a woman to, and we'll look at that in a second. What's the deal here? Is this just Paul? Paul says, okay, here's what I desire, verse 8. Okay, Timothy, here's what I exhort, verse 12. Okay, Timothy, here's what I do not permit. Is this what Paul himself, personally, only by himself, was exhorting and desiring and allowing? Okay. If Paul is right... Uh, now... Uh, we, I, I don't want to deal with this, um, but, uh, you, okay, I'll deal with it. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You talked me into it. I'm not going to deal with this, but I want you to see this terminology. First Corinth, did I say 1 Corinthians chapter 7? I just did. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm not going to get into this, to this matter, but I want you to see another place where Paul uses it. And the reason I want you to see this is to understand the way man has abused this kind of language. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. Now to the married I command, yet not I but the Lord. Okay, stop there for a second. Paul's writing and says, okay, you married people. Here's what I command you, yet it's not I command you but the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband. Who's, who's this command coming from? But why would he say, I command you, if it's coming from the Lord? Th hold that. Think about that for a second. Look in verse 12. Now to the rest, I, not the Lord, say. Hold the phone for a second. We just spent four weeks on our Wednesday night class talking about the fact that every word in the Bible is from God. Is that true? All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Did God choose every word that's in your Bible? If he did, why would this verse say, Now to the rest of you, I say, but not the Lord. And then say, was that, were those words then that Paul was saying there not from the Lord? Was he able to insert an idea here? Okay, this is what I'm saying, not the Lord. And... If he was, at what, point, at what point in that passage do you see Paul putting a period and then saying, okay, here's the words from the Lord now, and these aren't my words anymore? Okay, he's inspired by God. Were there things that, that Paul wrote about and taught that perhaps, and, and this is the short version because I want to get back to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Were there things that Paul would have written about in his 13 letters that Jesus did not specific, the Lord Jesus did not specifically talk about, deal with while he was on the earth? Yes. yes. That's what he's talking about here. All right. That's the, that's the short of the long of it is that this is not something that Paul is making up on his own. If it is, go back to our Wednesday night class. This book is worthless. If I'm going to read the words of a man and I, I can't tell where I'm reading the words of a man and where I'm reading the words of God, uh, 
the, the book is worthless. But that's what Paul is saying. The short of it is this is not necessarily something Jesus talked about, the Lord talked about on this earth, but this is something that I am writing to you from the Lord. Why, how do I know that? Look in chapter 14, verse 37. We're coming back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Then we're coming back to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Boy, do I get off on some rabbits here. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37. If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you. Wait a minute, who's writing? Paul is. The things that I write to you. What things? The things that he writes. Did he write 1 Corinthians chapter 7? Yep. Did he write 1 Corinthians chapter 14? Did he write uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2? Yep, okay. So let him acknowledge that the things that I write to you are what? The commandments of Paul. The commandments of the apostles as we got our counsel together and figured out what this whole Christianity thing would look like. These things that I'm writing to you are the commandments of the Lord. So when Paul says... This is what I command you, but not I, not only I, but the Lord. This was something Jesus had dealt with while he was on the earth, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 12, or verse 10. But verse 12, here's something Jesus had not dealt with while he was on the earth, but it's still what? A commandment of the Lord. Why? Because Paul is writing under inspiration. Now, what's happened, the reason I went to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, what's happened with 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is that, uh, unfortunately, we have had folks go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and have used terminology to talk about the Pauline privilege. When in, 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 a, in a discussion of marriage and divorce and remarriage, some people talk about a Pauline privilege. That Paul had some different ideas, his own personal ideas, that he interjected into Scripture on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Such could not be further from the truth. That's not what we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. These are not Paul's ideas. These are all the Lord's commandments. These are not Paul's commandments about uh, marriage and divorce. These are not Jesus' commandments uh, uh, alone. These are all the Lord's commandments. Does that make sense? Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 2. That was, a, that was a long way to get to a point that I wanted to make in 1, Corinthians, or 1 Timothy chapter 2. When Paul says in, in verse 1, I exhort. Verse 8, I desire. Verse 12, I do not permit. Is this something personal? Is this just Paul? No. These words are the Lord's words like every other word that Paul chose. That being the case, why would he use first person, first person pronoun then? Trina? Trina? So okay. actually, he wasn't speaking on his own accord, he was speaking on God's behalf. He was not speaking on his own accord, he was speaking on God's behalf. When, when Jesus, we pointed these verses out in our Wednesday night class, when Jesus sent his apostles out, were they supposed to worry about what they would say? Why not? Because it would be given to them by the Spirit. Were they supposed to meditate beforehand, to study beforehand and decide what they would say and how they would answer. No, nope. why? Because the very words that they needed would be given to them. When they went out speaking and preaching and writing, were they deciding what words to use? They weren't. It's, Paul had to defend his own apostleship. Why is that a big deal? Because as an apostle, they were given authority from the Lord to command. When, when Jesus said to his apostles, I'm coming to you, I see your hand, Nicole. When Jesus said to his apostles in Matthew 18, 18, that whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. He's talking to his apostles. Whatever they go out and teach people they have to do in order to be saved, Jesus says, guess what? That's already been bound and determined in heaven. Well, how did the apostles know that? Because they weren't choosing those words. They were being given to them by heaven. So somebody says, okay, that doesn't make sense though. Boy, we're getting off on a, on a, okay. Somebody says that doesn't make sense though. How does Paul use first person pronouns? Why does any writer use first person pronouns? 
Why do Paul's writings appear different than Peter's writings? By the way, if you'll pick up and just uh, listen to somebody reading a section of the Bible, you might not be able to know where it's from right away, but you might recognize terminology. Say, hey, that sounds like Paul. What do you mean that sounds like Paul? If the Holy Spirit inspired every writer, how could something sound like Paul or sound like Peter or sound like John? Do you know any writer in the Bible who, who talks about the disciple whom Jesus loved? Do you read that in Paul's writings? Nope. Why don't you read it in Paul's writings? Whose writings do you read, the disciple whom Jesus loved? John's writings. Why do you read it only in John's writings? Because John's writing about himself. And he doesn't call himself by name, doesn't use first person pronoun. He talks about the disciple. Who... But if the Holy Spirit decided every word, why would there be differences? They had personalities, but that still is confusing. If they've got personalities, what does that matter if the Holy Spirit is deciding those words? Guess what we're not ever going to be able to comprehend? The how of inspiration. This side of eternity, I don't think you and I are ever going to be able to know or yet comprehend exactly how inspiration worked. Are we? I mean, how did God get his thoughts and get his words into man's mind and then get that to his pen? If you, you know, we, we write stuff down and we go back and read our own writing later and we're like, I can't even make out my own writing. How, how did God get his words through man and write to his fingers? How does that work? I don't know all of the how of it, but you know what? That doesn't matter. Does it matter if I know every detail of the how of inspiration? No. What do I know? All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. That's what I know. And I, and I can know with certainty that every word that I have in my Bible is from God. How did it get there? How, how did every single syllable and every word and every personality Get in there. How was Paul permitted to say about Timothy uh, in Philippians chapter 2? that I'm coming to you, Nicole. Uh, how, did, how did Paul, how was he able to say about Timothy in, first, in Philippians chapter 2 that I have no one like-minded? Something so personal like that. How was Moses permitted to say there's no one, uh, Moses is, is the meekest man on earth? Boy, that's, a, that's an arrogant thing to say. You know, that doesn't sound, you know, wh why was he permitted to write? Every word in the Bible is from God. We, we, we've got to put our stake down there, and I know, I know we've dealt with that on Wednesday nights, but when we get down into verse 12 of this passage, and eventually we will, when we get down into verse 12 and Paul says, I do not permit a woman, is this just, here, here's another side of what Paul, people do with this, is this, just, is this just arrogant Paul? Is this male chauvinist Paul? You'll read that, that Paul was a male chauvinist, and he, it, this was just something personal for him. You know, and they, so, you know, people speculate, you know, his mother must have done something. You know, must, he must have had a bad childhood. You maybe, maybe he had a bad relationship. Who cares? These words are from God. Okay, Nicole, I'm there. You already flipped the verse I was going to say about Matthew 16 and 19 where we're talking about where we find in heaven. So I already went where you went. So you don't have to come to the Oh, well, I already did. Yeah. I already went where you went and I already came to you. Dirk, I'm over here. Well, Dirk, Dirk, Dirk's saying that God, you know, uses different men to give different perspectives, and he, and he does that. You know, why, why do we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Why don't we just have Jesus? You know, why, why don't we just have a book called Jesus, you know, instead of four different accounts of the gospel? You know, when, when somebody's writing about Jesus to the Jews, why didn't Luke do that one? Why didn't Luke write the book to the Jews? Did Matthew have a different perspective? Did Matthew have a different uh, credibility that he could provide to the Jews? Lonnie? 
I, 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 think, I, think it's, uh, I think it's incredible for us to try to fathom, you know, that, that everything we have in this book is from God. It makes that claim, but it backs up that claim uh, with, uh, with uh, astounding evidence that everything in here is from God. And, it, and, and to me, it builds my faith to think that, some, that God could take somebody like Paul, change his life, and use him, as we saw earlier in chapter 1, chapter 1, verse 4, or 12 through 15, that God enabled him, he put him into the work. He put him into the service of the, of the Lord's church. And not only that, that he could use such a man to write most of what we have in the New Testament. Uh, and, and, and that builds our faith. We're, we're, uh, we're going to come up short here, but look at what Paul says in verse 8. I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Paul had used all men in verse 1, all men in verse 4. Uh, remember what word that was? That was the Greek word anthropos. That's talking about mankind. So it's obvious that God knew and Paul knew the broad term for mankind, the word anthropos, um, he had used that word, but you get down to verse 8, that's not the word here. I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere. And this is not anthropos, this is the Greek word aner, which is the word for male. Which is the word not only for male, but it was so, and, and I don't know that you can get more specific than male, but it was so specific that it absolutely did exclude women. It was exclusive to males. I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere. Okay? Does that mean that women cannot pray? Well, this says, God desires that the men pray everywhere. Does that mean that women are not allowed to pray at all? They have to go in the closet. Good, good, good. I'm glad a woman said that and not a man, uh, that they've got to go in the closet to pray. Are women permitted to lead in prayer everywhere? They're not? Why do you say no? Well, probably because you know down in verse 11 and 12. I desire, therefore, and here's this, here's this context of worship. How much time do we have, Buzz? We've got a minute. How, we, here's this context of worship. And in this context, God says, I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere. And we're, we're going to get into the role of women next week. I really wanted to get there this week, uh, but chased, uh, chased too many rabbits. Uh, that the men pray everywhere. What's their, what is their physical posture supposed to be? By the way, this is, not, this is not an emphasis on their physical posture. The Bible does not command us to have a particular posture. Did you know the Bible does not command you to bow your head, close your eyes, uh, what's it? Oh, fold your hands, and the uh, Bible doesn't command us to do that. What's the emphasis here? The emphasis here is on holiness. We'll pick up there next week. The emphasis here is on holiness, the right kind of heart, and the right kind of attitude in prayer. We'll pick up in verse 8, talk about this.